Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining today. So we're gonna talk about the M word, which is, uh, you know, all, all roads apparently lead to the metaverse. Um, but uh, I think we're gonna talk a little bit about the differences between what is the hype and what is the reality. So we're here, I um, painstakingly uh, photoshopped a uh, hype cycle into the wheels of this bike. And then of course my team saw it and said, no one is gonna be able to see that. So now I have to point it out, um, but we are in sort of full hype cycle and it's, you know, we're coming up actually on almost a year of, uh, you know, Facebook having changed it, its name to Meta, uh, but it, it, it kind of feels like we're not that much further along in terms of a, you know, sort of building the metaverse and, and B, sort of there being a, a, a general, a generally agreed upon understanding of, of what it is. Uh, and of course, everyone is a, is a meta, metaverse expert. People are coming out of the woodwork, um, you know, for, who have been working in the industry for years and who have been working in the industry for days. Nevertheless, everyone still seems to be a metaverse expert. Um, but don't believe the hype. And, you know, when we talk about experts, like, you know, there are people who have been in the industry for decades and have been working with this technology for decades, and they don't call themselves experts. I don't think anybody is really an expert, and it's not about being an expert. I think it's really about perspective and, and, and what all of us actually want from this digital realm. And you know, one of the, the questions I always get asked by, uh, you know, our, our clients is, you know, they're like, how should we be getting into the, met, you know, into the metaverse? Are we, are we missing the boat? And, you know, no, you don't need to rush into the metaverse, um, but it is important to have a strategy. So if you're an artist or if you're a company, uh, you know, whatever realm you are in, you have to think about, you know, what, who is your audience and who do you want to engage with and, and how do you want to engage with them? And I would also like to point out that the metaverse did not just fall from the sky. So it has been around in one form or another for decades. And, you know, really virtual reality and virtual environments are sort of the first metaverse. Um, but it, I think that that definition has evolved over the years. So we'll see this little video. I hope you can write in the, in the chat if this sounds or looks horrible. The next technological boom propelling us forward from virtual reality will mark an event horizon so dramatic that it very well may be the beginning of the end of human life as we've defined it. I'm not talking end of days. It's more an evolution of the human form. Once we get a taste of this escapism, we may never want to come back. And if you're like me, you're probably wondering, can I really be seduced? And if so, what will it feel like to escape into this shared online world? Well, try this on for size. If we have 100 billion brain cells, we have about 100 million or so of those that are leading out to our nerves. Touch, our vision, smell, everything. What would it be like to have 100 times more nerves? that we're connecting you to the world around you. What would it be like to, to touch someone with 100 more times the nerve endings than you have in your skin today? And in a computer, you could do this. The metaverse, a limitless digital refuge from our less than perfect world, driven by an artificially intelligent engine. Once we hook in, we will access recesses in our brain we never knew existed, connect with minds all over the planet, and collectively rebuild the world as we envision it, digital brick by digital brick. The metaverse connects all humans in one shared idea space. You can interact with other people like we do in the physical world. You can interact with the environment, move things, touch things. A shared, joint virtual reality that you can move around in, that most of society have access to. In the future, we'll be able to create an imaginary world the size of a planet. I mean, there'll be virtual construction companies and architects and all these sorts of crazy jobs that would sound ridiculous now, but are completely inevitable. Even in a completely digital form, 
will form into tribes and groups and find our people and fall in love and, and do all these things. But I bet we'll still have very rich decisions going on around, you know, how we choose to live with each other. And that is still going to be a very fundamental conflict that is going to be just as real inside a digital matter as it would be in the real world. Ah, yes, the ever-evolving calculus of love and relationships in a world we design. The temptation could be unimaginable. So that gives us, you know, sort of a, a protopian vision, but it gives us a glimpse into what a dystopian version of the metaverse might be. But I'd like to dial back and we'll do like a little, this will be interactive and you can type your answers in the chat. We're going to have a little quiz uh, and we'll talk just a, a little bit about the history of the metaverse. So quiz question number one, when was virtual reality first mentioned in literature? And if you want to play along, you can just type a guess into the chat or if you happen to know. Uh, and I'm going to give you a hint. It was French playwright Antonin Artaud's Le Théâtre et Son Double. And the year, which I found surprising when I was doing some research last year, was 1938. So this idea of a virtual reality, and of course, when you think about it, a play is a form of virtual reality. You sort of suspend belief and you're creating a version of reality on stage. Um, so this concept has been around for a very long time. All right, so question number two, which will be a little bit easier, is who was the first to use the term metaverse? And... Uh, you probably, a lot of you probably already knew this one. It was Neil Stevenson in his book, Snow Crash, which is a really, really great book. If you have not read it, I highly recommend it. And he said it very simply, the metaverse is a fictional structure made out of code. And again, earlier I mentioned that I think that that definition has expanded a little bit depending on who you talk to. And then this last one, what was arguably the original metaverse? And this is a screenshot of it. And we saw actually both founders in the video. And this is a quote from one of them. Oh, everything you're seeing now, the community built, it's part of a new weird nation where all bets are off. Here, the future is yours to create. Well, this of course was Second Life, which you know has been around since 2007. It was a web-based world and people were actually you know, making a living uh, buying and selling digital assets. And so if you want to look at what the kind of creator economy could scale into, that's a good place to start to kind of look at uh, how, you know, who, who was making money. There are people who were, you know, that was their only form of income, uh, creating these beautiful digital assets that other people were, were buying. But I think the important thing is, is not to think of you know, the metaverse as a destination, but really thinking about it as a journey that all of us collectively can build together. To me, that's, that's the real promise. I mean, we saw in the video you know, really talking about how we'll find our tribes and we'll find our communities. It's a way for us to, to, to bring back this idea of a global village um, within this virtual realm where we don't have to bring politics and we don't have to bring boundaries and borders in, um, where really we can just be a version of ourselves, right? We're never at any given moment a full version of ourselves. We're always presenting different facets. And this would be a way for us to connect with people uh, you know, based on our interests, based on any number of factors in a completely different way. But in its, its pure form, what the metaverse is, is really the internet, but in 3D. And the world will become our screen. So we have the devices coming out that are really going to be the magic wayfarers. Right now, they're, they're limited because it's incredibly difficult technology. Uh, but both Apple and Facebook are coming with their next generation devices, which will actually allow us to see the real world around us uh, while also having a digital overlay. It's not quite that idea of uh, you know, true mixed reality, which I'll talk about. I have a slide on that uh, in, in a 
in a few seconds, but um, but it but it's getting us there, right? And this is a stepped approach because there's still a lot of shortcomings with the technology that we have to work on. But effectively, data will live all around us. You can walk into any environment in the near future, and actually even now in some cases, and there are a multitude of invisible digital layers that will be made available to us based on different types of permissions or breaking geofences or even just our connections having shared uh, a, a, a digital experience with us and we will be notified when we come near that particular experience. But really what's going to happen is that the lines between the physical and digital will be blurred. I don't believe that anytime in the near future, we're going to be spending, you know, half of our lives in, in fully digital environments. What I see is this, this blend of the physical and digital. So there will be these overlays of, um, you know, digitization and digital data and digital art and creativity uh, all around us at all times. So what could go wrong? It's the question we're all asking ourselves. Well, first and foremost, we must, mustn't allow ourselves to become digital lab rats. And, and the data now that is being collected when we have these devices, because they have inward facing cameras, we have eye tracking, you know, those cameras are able to actually de detect um, really what could be, you know, considered medical data. Right. And and how we're feeling and and how an image makes us feel by the way that our pupils react. And so that kind of data in the wrong hands is incredibly dangerous. And the metaverse should not be controlled by individual companies. It should be open and accessible to everyone. All right. Last quiz question. Who is the metaverse for? I mean, it's everyone in the whole entire world. <laughs> I mean, everyone. Now, that video wasn't entirely necessary, but now you will remember, you will equate the metaverse and everyone. All right, so let's put all the meta elements together. So from sort of a, a technology stack pers perspective, these environments are incredibly com complex. They are virtual worlds. Um, most of them are built on game engines. Um, but really, I think of it as the evolution of reality. So you've got you know, augmented reality on one end of the spectrum, and augmented reality is really just a digital overlay. So if any of you ever played Pokemon Go, I actually used to turn off the AR functionality because I found it really annoying that the characters would just sort of be plonked down in the world and had no context with the real world. Uh, and then, of course, on the other end of the spectrum, you have virtual reality where you're, you know, you're in a headset and you cannot see your surroundings at all. And these are completely controlled digital environments. But when I talk about the lines of the physical and digital being blurred, that's sort of in that central area of mixed reality. Some people call it spatial computing. Um, but really, it's, it's a seamless blend of the physical and digital. And the difference between mixed reality and augmented reality is really that in mixed reality, those digital overlays have context to the real world, whether that, that be something that's actually anchored in physical space that has to do with your surroundings or where that physical or that digital overlay uh, actually has context to a physical object. So in that example, in the middle there, you've got someone doing remote technical assistant while someone's trying to fix a piece of machinery. There's a digital overlay with instructions, and then you even have a live person beaming in remotely uh, who can actually see everything that the technician sees and can help walk them through that experience. And then, of course, Web3, which is not the metaverse, but it is sort of the underlying technology. So you know, if you think about, um, you know, a, a, an example, you know, the metaverse would be, you know, a, sort of a website, a 3D website, and Web 3.0 would be the network. And so Web 1 was, you know, early days, mostly static, you know, web pages, PDFs, read only. Uh, but it was also decentralized. So it was, you know, peer to peer server construct. And then we were able to move to the two way web, uh, web where we were able to read and write to the web. Uh, it also enabled e commerce, um, but it became centralized. And we saw social media and uh, alongside e commerce evolve. And then now evolving into web three, we have the semantic web where these experiences now will move from 2D to 3D. 
And not only can we read and write, but we can also co-create. And we're moving back to this decentralized construct. And then what this enables is identity, hopefully self-sovereign identity, meaning we manage our own data and identity, uh, games and the creator economy. And then of course, you know, when I say blockchain, the first thing everybody thinks of, of course, is Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. But um, you know, cryptocurrency is just a subset of blockchain and that blockchain technology is what allows us uh, to, you know, it really enables that, um, you know, decentralized construct. Uh, and, and in spite of all of the challenges around crypto and, and the instability around valuations, these valuations are all arbitrary, right? They're not anchored to real things. Like when currency first started, real currency, fiat currency was anchored to, um, to commodities. Uh, now, even fiat currency isn't anchored to commodities. It's it's around market factors and um, you know sort of international valuations, um, and and so we we have a long road ahead of us in um, trying to manage the way cryptocurrencies uh, are exchanged and and being able to stabilize them. AI is another key component. I'm going to check in the time, making sure we're we're good. Um, AI is another critical component of of uh, you know this entire construct, and of course NFTs, which is valuable, especially in this realm in this context of of our um, creativity conference. Um, you know, not as these again, sort of you know artificially scarce uh, you know digital assets but really uh, enabling the creator economy and allowing creators to be paid for their work uh, but the other interesting um, trend that is happening is that entertainment games social media and fashion are really all colliding they're all becoming kind of one construct and we're and again this is going to enable the creator economy it's going to allow us all to engage not only with each other, but with artists and games uh, and fashion in a completely different way. So some, some, you know, some of those who've, who've actually have sort of steamed in and have done some interesting things. Uh, you know, Gucci uh, uh, opened up a store, uh, also released some NFTs in uh, Roblox. And then Nike acquired Artifact, and they've done a couple of, of uh, really interesting drops. Uh, and then, of course, JP Morgan, I don't know who's going in and doing their banking in, in, in the metaverse, but they do have, you do have the ability to go in and speak with bankers and look at market trends and look at some of their services. And then, of course, Barbados actually opened up an embassy there. So you can go into the metaverse and get your visa, both for, you know, virtual Barbados and real Barbados. But this is really just scratching the surface. You know, and everyone talks about the killer app it's not the killer app that we need for for adoption it's really killer utility like we're not going to be leveraging this technology until it becomes as useful to us as our smartphones so i'm going to run through a few use cases i'm not going to do a deep dive on this but where we start i find it pretty interesting is where we're able you know we already have sensors on our got my apple watch we've already got sensors on our bodies but we're going to start having more smart clothing and again being able to leverage these devices uh, and the uh, eye tracking for our own personal wellness uh, and we have the opportunity to really work from with data from the inside out uh, v-commerce and virtual stores these have been around for a long time uh, and again, just building, going, you know, going into a virtual mall, to me, that's not interesting. But again, in the context of a physical space where you walk into a physical space, but it, that interior, instead of having a set set of products uh, that you see, might be very different for everyone who walks in. And sports, you can either use it you know, to improve performance or to improve your performance as a couch potato. Multiplayer games are going to live all around us all the time in real time. And of course, again, what we're all here for today at the Creativity Conference is uh, and something that I, I love the idea of just having all of this art living all around us all the time and being able to have all kinds of digital experiences just anywhere, anywhere we happen to be. But at its core, I think where the technology shines is in communication and collaboration. 
it's really the convergence of all of these technologies that we're talking about that's going to enable this at scale. And again, we're not quite there yet. We're, we're inching forward. We have a lot of the pieces. Um, and, but the missing piece for me is how we all want to engage. Like, what haven't we imagined? What do we want this digital realm to look like? Like, to me, it doesn't make sense just to make a digital replica of the real world. Why do I show that video? That is a version of, you know, what Airbus thinks the future might look like. And what happens is uh, it's no coincidence that augmented reality looks like Minority Report or Iron Man. It's because we see it and we think, all right, well, that looks like it could be the future. And we sort of internalize it and we don't really build a picture for ourselves of, of what we want the world to look like. And so when you think about true innovation, it really happens with a blank canvas, but it's also something that I think we all should be engaging with on a day-to-day -day basis. And as creators, especially, um, you know, the, the, the beauty of creators is that they're able to create something from nothing. Uh, and so I think we need to take that skill and kind of extrapolate from where we are today and, and build a vision that we all care about for the future to use Steve Jobs, actually Apple, and it's actually not grammatically correct, think, <laughs> think different. It is actually think differently. Um, but we can leverage this technology to augment humanity in defining entirely new systems, um, different systems for education uh, and creativity. The, the, there's entirely new tools for, for creating in this digital realm. Um, and diversity, and diversity in all its forms, and, and not just, you know, kind of getting stuck on gender, race, and culture, but really a, a broad base of diversity, including experience, expertise, in, you know, interest, identity, nationality, you know, and abilities, perspectives, outlooks, right, and, and really embracing our diverse natures. And identity, identity is a key component of all of this, like we have to 
begin to take responsibility for our own identities in this digital landscape and also like put forward the effort to manage our own data and value what i'd like to see is us you know build a different value construct than we are we already have with uh, fiat currency and measure worth not just in money or economics, but really in how we improve the human experience and how could we leverage those data points to have value, uh, you know, in the world, right, other than what we have today, because we are very, very driven by just making money. But there's much more that we can do to supplement that. And, and if we take control of our identity and our data, that data is a database. And there are data points that could actually be assigned value in this digital landscape and this digital economy. And as I mentioned, art imitates life, life imitates art. So we can leave it up to the few storytellers out there uh, who are envisioning the future, or we can all build a picture of what we want and work together to build it. Because to me, the metaverse is not about the technology. It really is about humanity. And we have the ability to create our own superhuman future, right? We are all the storytellers of the future. And the possibilities are truly infinite. I'm going to leave you with this last video. Staring at this empty room Looked at a thousand different pictures That your mother took of you It's a this crazy dream last night This man, he talked to me He told me everything was good and bad About my history
So what would you do if you had all of that technology? Well, it is all here now. So everything in that video, those, those exist. Those are different applications that you could use today. So the question is, what's next? Well, this is my favorite quote. The best way to predict the future is to create it. So let's create something brilliant. Thanks so much. All right, we have, uh, let's do do one question because I know we ran a little long. Sorry about that, everyone. Go ahead and type your question in the chat if you've got it. Or we're, we're a small group. You can, you can just unmute. I've got a question. Hi, Billy. <laughs> Hi, you. Um, my question is, and you really touched on it and you wove it all the way through the talk, okay, is that we're trying to create a future. And at the moment, our present is created in a way that's focused on wealth. Yeah. Wealth and greed seems to drive a lot of things that, even in today's world, okay, there are people who choose to be who, um, you know, brandish and ch cherish and value our humanity, okay? There are certain human beings who are doing that and try to live lives like that. And then at the other end of the, I mean, I'm not judging anybody, I'm just saying people's choices. And at the other end of the spectrum is you have human beings who are literally just driven you know companies are interested in stakeholders and and I, what i'm the i love what you said and i was like thinking so how are, are we going to create this new world where people are going to be more less focused on wealth when we can't seem to do it in the real world that we live in that was like the um, thing that was going through my head so i'd love yeah, to hear what yeah, you think so about that so you know, I'm I'm a big believer in the in the sort of pro, the protopian vision of the future, and that technology yeah. can enable that. Um, but but we forget that we have agency in the future, and that we have voices. And I think it's it's really easy to feel that you know, as an individual, you know, what are we going to do? Right? Politicians are controlling things, leaders are controlling things, and and we don't have a voice. But in aggregate consumers do. And you, you look at, at GDPR, for example, that was enacted and, and the same in, in you know, data protection in the US. That was enacted because consumers said enough of our data not only being harvested and monetized, but then being used to manipulate us in, in ways that uh, have been actually fairly sinister. So, you know, when I say that we don't build a vision of the future, you know, most of the, the, the even, even with, with my clients, but even just with my friends, when I say, you know, what's your, um, you know, your, your fantasy for yourself in 25 years, we don't have that. We have not constructed that for ourselves. And unless we have a North Star, mm -hmm. we don't have something to aspire to. We are letting, um, and it's fine that it's media, right? And there are world builders and, and uh, science fiction writers. But, but now those science fiction writers, believe it or not, the things that they wrote back in the 70s now are shaping what the future is going to look like. And we're just going, okay, let's just yeah, do that because someone's already it, figured it out. Right? It doesn't the, have the to be fantasy, that cookie cut. Exactly. And the fantasy, and this is a lot of the work that I know you do, is, is sort of looking within. But I'm saying look, look within but project yourself, I don't know, 25 years in the future. And by the way, you're not dead in 25 years. In fact, in 25 years, I look better, I'm younger, I'm thinner, mm -hmm. I'm smarter, I speak 500 languages. You know, it's a fantasy. Don't base it in reality because there are, even though there are some things that are going, seemingly going to be impossible, it's willing those things to be possible. The reason that records are broken is that somebody raises the bar and then, oh, wow, then suddenly it, everybody hits that bar. Then there's a new bar. Well, we need to create that bar for ourselves as individuals. And we will be very surprised at how many 
of this sort of a Venn diagram, like in the center, we all want similar things. So let's work on that construct together and, and build this future. And the nice thing about being in these virtual environments is that they are boundaryless, right? So we can do this on a global level. And I'm sorry, but I have a hard stop in like two minutes, but um, thank you for the question, Billy. It's great to see you, John. Nice to see you. And everybody else, thank you so much for joining today. Find me on LinkedIn. Happy to continue the conversation. Mm -hmm.